Okay, well, my name is Scott Thomas. I'm a retired archaeologist from Burns BLM. Worked here for 23 years. Um, this is my place. I mean, I I grew up. I remember going to this the uh, French Glen Hotel when I was a kid. When I was 13, my dad, and mom took us to the French Glen Hotel for a couple weeks, and that was my first exposure to Burns and then or Burns in Harney County. And then I, when I was in undergrad school, I came over for every field trip we ever took on you know, mammalogy, herpetology, botany. I mean, just all these different natural science field trips we ended up over here. And then I went into anthropology, my graduate student, my graduate studies, and my field school was at the Valley Refuge. So I finally ended up getting here in 1995. It took me a long time to get back. But uh, well, I worked here as a temporary in 1980 for about a year. So anyway. So I really love Harney County, and, and one of the things I'm going to talk about tonight is, is edible plants, but they aren't just edible, they're also flowers, spring flowers, and uh, people drive over here from Bend and go, man, it's so desolate, it's so boring, and, but if they got out of their car this time of year and walked about 30 feet off the road, they go, whoa, look at all the wildflowers, yeah. there's yeah. tons of them, so, and I'm kind of a plant guy, my wife and I own a nursery in Triangle for 10 years, so that kind of kind of got me to plants and I've always been a gardener, so that's my introduction. Um, the second slide is print, so I will read it because you guys I don't think are going to be able to tell. Um, by the way, before we get started, you feel free to ask questions anytime during the presentation. Just be sure you say it loud enough so everybody can hear you, so we will, they'll know what my answer means. Um, I'm not a botanist, but I have a year of life. But I have a great interest in native plants, edible or not. I gain most of my knowledge and experience from reading, being in the field, learning to identify the various plants, and on field trips with tribal elders early on in my 23 years at Burns BLM. Harvesting edible spring roots, bulbs, and flowers has been an act, annual activity for Indian tribes for thousands of years. Like harvesting in a vast garden, the earliest Americans knew where the different plants grew had a specific way of harvesting them and ate them fresh or dried them for storage for use later. Families of the Burns Coyote tribe harvest spring roots today, keeping their link to the past alive. It is an activity that keeps their traditions thriving and all the knowledge about harvesting and preparing the plant foods is passed down from generation to generation. I've been told that for, for some of the people it is a spiritual experience as well as a chance to harvest and eat the foods that sustain them for so many generations. If you happen upon some tribal members digging roots, give them some privacy and move on. Because um, they like to be out there kind of enjoying everything without distractions. A majority of edible spring plants found in Harney County are Lomatians, and that's the uh, genus name. The, uh, Latin genus name. Lomatians are all members of the carrot family, and there are more species of this genus in Harney County than anywhere I've seen anywhere. Most like very rocky clay soils and range from the foothills of the Blue Mountains in the north and extend to the Steens Mountain in the south. And that's just Harney County. There's there's Lomatians growing everywhere in the north in the northwest. It isn't just in Harney County, but I think we have one of the best populations of all those different species of anywhere in Oregon, at least. Um, I know the Burns Paiute aren't happy when people come from other tribes to dig here. And I think I know why other tribes come here, because they have such great places to dig for roots here. Um, there are many other varieties of plants besides lomations that were harvested in the spring. This slideshow is intended to show you photographs of all the important plants that the earliest Americans harvested, and we'll talk about what parts are eaten and how they were cooked or prepared for future consumption. I would recommend that you can identify the inedible or poisonous plants that grow in similar environments before you harvest any wild plants and eat them. Um, next slide, please. And here are some reasons why, or a couple of reasons why. This is called death canvas. Um, I'm still uncertain in my mind if death camas actually grows where regular camas grows, because I've never seen it in a meadow. I've always seen it on rockier, drier sites. But they're a lily, 
same as cannabis. They're a white flower or kind of a light yellowish flower. Um, they flower about the same time as cannabis, between April and July. They grow about two feet tall, which is about that same height as blue cannabis. Um, their bulbs are oval and look like onions, but do not smell like onions. And neither do cannabis. They don't smell like onions either. So the regular good kind. So I'm 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 still puzzling about this, and I haven't got a solution. So you see a white cannabis in a, a bunch of blue cannabis, don't dig it. And if you see something like this on a more dry hillside in the rocks, don't eat it. It's, it's called death camas. It doesn't sound as bad as the next one, but it's bad enough. Scott? Yeah. There are two species of camas here. That's the Nicolaitum. There's another one whose name I don't know. Another two species of death camas? Yes. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. see, that's why it's good and to have experts here. See, the other one does grow in meadows. In, in meadows? I've never seen it with the red the regular camas. Yeah, see, I was always thinking that if you had a white camas growing in a bunch of blue camases, the way botany works is that there's what they call sports, where a new specific, a new color will emerge. That's how, that's how people that grow annual flowers make their money because they, they find new things and then propagate them. The problem with the other camas is that it grows in the lower water meadows. And yeah. It could possibly. Show yeah. So up. don't ever dig a white camas anywhere. Or anything that looks like a white canvas because it's deadly. Well, it's not as deadly as the next one. Next slide, please. Um, water hemlock. It's hard to see this, but um, water hemlock, from what I read today on Wikia, Wiki Reads, so I didn't know Wiki. Wikipedia, <laughs> thank you. What I read on Wikipedia today. Wiki Lakes. <laughs> I, was, I was checking to see you know, how bad the two were comparatively. It's a lot worse than death canvas. Um, it's, it's the most uh, toxic plant in North America. It's also in the carrot family, which is great. Um, it tends to grow in wet places, even in water, and on the edges of streams, on the edges of ponds. Um, it's, it's, its leaves look kind of like marijuana to me. Um, not that I've ever seen a leaf of marijuana. This is what I've seen on pictures and stuff. Right, right, right. But if you look at the Indian carrot foliage, which is this little picture in the middle, that's what Indian carrots look like. So their foliage is totally different. But they have a lot of similarities because they have the same white, humble flower. They're about the same height. Um, the only difference is like Indian carrots tend to like drier, drier sites with deeper soil, and they're not necessarily going to grow in the water. And unfortunately, um, Indian carrots are my favorite one to eat, and I, I can identify them, but I would hate to see somebody go out and go, oh, there's an Indian carrot, dig it up and find out that it was water hemlock. I don't, I don't know if I've ever even seen water hemlock when I've been out, because I usually go to rocky, dry places, not wet areas. So anyway, that's the second warning. You definitely don't want to dig anything that looks like that with leaves like that. And there is some up and down facilities. Is there? Especially up. Oh, from Idlewild down to the intersection. See, it's so. good to hear local knowledge because, you know, I, I'm assuming it's around somewhere, but I've never seen it. But I'm never in the right place to see it, I guess. Well, who wants to be there? <laughs> I, don't, I like being up on the rocky stuff. Um, anyway, next slide. Okay, uh, what well, is hard to see? Uh, there's two major tools or classes of tools for harvesting and preparing um, edible plants. Let me get my digging stick here. This is what I dig with sometimes. Um, and this is a modern, this is sort of a shape like the prehistoric one, but it's modern in reproduction. And there's a place in Madras that makes them. I know for the Warm Springs tribe. I don't know about where the Paiutes get theirs, but I assume they they know about the Madras place. So, but it's made out of spring steel. So when you stick it in the ground and start prying up, it doesn't stay bent. It springs back to the right shape. But back in the old days, they used the Indian people used um, mountain mahogany as their digging stick choice because it's very hard, kind of like ironwood. It, it holds its point really well and uh, lasts for a long time. Everybody hear me all right? 
Okay. Just don't want to be too noisy. Anyway, and then at the other end of things, well, I could rabbit hole on this one, but when, since I work for BLM, there's a lot of root ground on BLM land and uh, public land that's managed by BLM. And when we go out and look at the root ground every year, because we did monitoring just to see how things are going, um, we would never find, I don't remember ever finding an arrow point or a spear point or any of the hunting type tools in the root ground. All we would ever find were little scrapers or just flake knives, little basalt or obsidian flake knives. And and my theory is that that women that did most of this stuff, which is a lot of hard work, <laughs> they had, they cut the tops off or just run the tops off of these roots when they picked them. And they may have used those little scrapers for either cutting the top off or scraping the, the outer skin off. Because um, you'll be able to look at the lamation over here, but they're white now because I scraped all the black or brown uh, skin off. Anyway, that's my theory. I don't know if it's true. It's just something that you know I've been thinking about for 23 years. So, at any rate, um, but a hopper mortar, if you look at where all the hopper mortars are found on Burns BLM land, and we found, we've seen a lot, they'll almost always be somewhere where you can get edible roots. Now there's another grindstone called Matati that's flat and doesn't have a circular depression in the middle of it. And that's used, I think, for grinding grain or has a more specific uh, reason for use other than grinding up roots. And the reason I say that is if you try to dry a lamation, the, the uh, biscuit root is a common name. I should have said that a while ago. <laughs> Sorry. Um, if you dry that and then try to pound it on a flat surface, three quarters of what you're pounding is going to be somewhere five feet or ten feet that way because it's like it's like beating up on really hard styrofoam. It's really bouncy, hard to break up. So it, it those hopper mortars, I think a lot of times they were fitted with a basket, and that's a modern version there. But they were, had a basket that was adhered to the rock around that little concavity. And so when they hit those things, they hit the basket and fall back in. Because otherwise they're going to waste a lot of root trying to grind them up on a flat grinding slab. And that's another theory I've been thinking about for 23 years, but I don't know if it's true. Archaeologists bloom a lot, I guess. Um, so after they got the flower, and I'm going to try to do this for the Archaeology Roadshow and Culture Keepers show on June 24th, I want to go collect some more lamation, dry them, and then make little cakes to serve to my the people who come to my edible plant booth. I'll put a little onion in there to make them a little more pizzazzy. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, but they would moisten that flour and basically just roast them on a hot rock, like around a campfire, like we would uh, talk. Uh, to, what am I trying to say? Like you would a tortilla <laughs> or some oh. other kind of flatbread. And if there's some other way to cook them, I'd like to hear it because I, I think that I also read that they would, they would roast them and then dry them, which I hadn't heard that one before. But that sounds kind of good. Um, anyway, next slide. Okay, um, this is a picture that's not all that clear of where I was working and where I was digging roots last Sunday, Saturday. Saturday. But if you look at this picture, there's three edible plants that you can identify. And um, one's a flower, it's called Alice Clover, and then there's biscuit root and bitter root. But the ground right now, I'm just driving around out there, is just bright yellow with all the, all the other yellow flowering plants plus all the biscuit root. So it's really intense, really rich. Am I sounding okay out, Gina? Okay. Shouldn't touch. I won't touch anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> Next slide. This is the earliest one. I was told that the Paiute name for this means little deer turd. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, it's got a little round bulb or tuber at the bottom. And as you can see in the picture, that's a dime on the right hand side. So it's tiny oh. and it's available really early. In fact, we were out there last weekend and we didn't see any flowers. They were all, well, two weeks ago they were out there and we didn't see any flowers. 
clear down the window, but we still saw the plants. And the tubers on this are eaten and they taste mildly like a carrot. And I think they could be thrown in with a hopper or with any of the other lomations to make flour. Next slide. This is the second earliest one um, called Lomation Wavenii, named after a guy named Moraven. Um, tubers were eaten and they're also really tiny and they grow in essentially the same place as that all the rest of the Lomations vista roots grow. And the interesting thing about this one, this was our rare, or our, our uh, not rare and endangered list, but our list we were keeping track of because we weren't seeing it much. And we we went to a, a place out past, at the end of the stinking waters one time, we found about 600 acres of it. So it's okay, it's gonna be fine. But it's a really interesting one. It's got kind of velvety grayish green leaves and little white flowers and uh, it tastes just like the last one I showed you, but it's um, got a little bit bigger bowl, or tuber, excuse me. Next one. This one, um, Lomation candii, also called salt and pepper Lomation or salt and pepper vista root. I don't know why people dig it, because uh, <laughs> I've done this before and it smells like kerosene. Yeah. Really strong kerosene. In fact, you could tear one apart and put it in your car and then drive off in about 10 minutes later. You're like, wow, what is that smell? <laughs> so I don't know if it gets better after you dry it or not, but I've never eaten it. Medicine. Is it medicine? Because I know that people that it's have got, tried to dig it's it. It's got some lung properties to it. Oh, really? And that's one of the reasons they came down to get it. Just for the tuber, though, right? Yeah, because I remember when I. It's, one it's of the true. elders told me one time that they they dug them and they had friends up north that really wanted it. Yeah, they really wanted it. They didn't tell me they weren't eating it. They just yeah, told me. It, it's I crazy. assume they were eating it. It was, it was a long way. Really? I tried it once and it wasn't oh, good. Yeah, this is boring. <laughs> uh, next one. This is the mainstay of all the biscuit roots. And it's named after uh, the word in Chinookan that means this plant is called cows. And I guess William Clark of the Lewis and Clark expedition was the one that heard a Chinookan speaker on the, on the Columbia River call it cows, and so he gave that as its species name. And it's it's the big daddy. I mean, it's the one that's super prolific. I remember one time driving out the steam South Loop Road, and there's a little borrow pit on each side, and I happened to catch it just at the right time, and those borrow pits were bright yellow. It's Lomation, the whole, it's kind of Lomation the whole way. You could have got out of your car, walked off the road, and dug up a 50 pound bag. Mm -hmm. Aren't they, the leaves more shiny than some of the other ones? Yeah, they are. They they're tend to be a darker like green and shiny. Yeah. Instead of kind of a, I noticed a lot of Lomations this last weekend that looked like cows, but they weren't cows. They didn't have a bowl. Um, at any rate, next slide, please. And I got lucky this Saturday and found one of these guys, Henderson's formation. And they bloom a little earlier than the, the one we just talked about. So this one had seed, had set seed or was getting set seed. And it had, it has, you can see it over there, it has a tuber about this big around. So if you can find any Henderson's, you're gonna score more, more pounds. The trouble is I don't ever see that many of them. So, um, but the tubers again were Eaten fresh or dried and ground or dried and rehydrated or whatever. Next slide. This is a great one. This is not dug for its roots. This is dug, this is basically just cut like you would cut off a uh, plant in your garden. It uh, tastes like celery. It's called Indian celery. I call it that anyway. Um, Lomation nudicali. Anyway, has a really strong flavor, and right now it's blooming. Um, it's kind of a short little gray green leaf, about this tall or even shorter. Um, I remember making a stew one time when I was back in my exper exper experimentation in, in uh, roots and stuff. And I had these roots, I had bitter root, I had some lomations, I had kiwi carrots, and I put them all together with some, with some uh, antelope meat that a friend of mine gave me, and then I threw in a bunch of that. 
bad idea. It, everything tasted like celery in this world. So if you're going to use it, use it. Use it lightly. Next slide. This is what's blooming up there now. Called, it's called big-headed clover or owl's clover. And uh, one of my favorite books on the bird's pie in particular about their love of plants and harvesting and what they use them for is written by a woman named Marilyn Couture who spent a long time on the reservation back in the 70s working with the elder ladies, um, looking at the different plants. And it's more than just plants, but she wrote basically an ethnology of the bird's pie, kind of at a late date, but I think she got good information. But anyway, this, is, this was uh, apparently sweet. And if you sucked on the blossom, you get some sweetness. Now, most of us are used to sweetness. You know, I try to avoid it if I can, um, but I normally can't. Anyway, but back in the day when they had almost nothing that was sweet to eat, you can imagine what it was such a treat for these kids to talk about the children actually getting a chance to suck on those and get that nectar out of them. Probably the first sweet thing they'd had in six months, unless they were able to harvest um, beehives or bee swarms. Next slide. This is one that I, um, I knew about when I lived in Prineville. It's pretty common around. It's a really early flowering bulb. Um, it's one of the first up. And it's uh, called Fritillaria pudica. It's a it's a, a yellow bells is what they call them in Prineville, and I guess they do here too. Anyway, it's got a little flying saucer down about four inches that it's a bulb. And it tastes, tastes okay to me. I've eaten a few of them. We had some the other day, didn't we? Oh, yeah. yeah you were there okay to you? Yeah. And you can see the size of it. There's a quarter there. We changed changed coins a while back because they're getting bigger now. Anyway, I took this uh, um, out in a sandy place. I didn't expect to see it, but it was right there. So, next slide. Okay, this is uh, one of my favorites. When I when I worked for the Forest Service over a um, big summit district near Prineville. I used to take cottage cheese in my lunch and I'd pull off the flowers off the top of these onions and throw them in my cottage cheese. Oh, yum. They were so good. Yeah. Um, anyway. Uh, and those are the white ones. Well, this is it's actually a mixture. Well, this is, yeah, it's a mixture. I have a mixture where it's nodding onion and there's the pink flowering one that hasn't flowered yet, but the nodding onion are flowering right now. And there are places out east of town where the whole hillside is nothing but you really want it, if you're short on garlic, this would be a good time. So it's... what I do now is I pick the flower bud. Yeah, I love the flower bud. And, and those will stay and you can dry them and put them in soup later. That's true, instead of ruining the bowl. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Oh, it's so pretty. Yeah, the, but the, the, the flower on the pink variety I like the best. <laughs> and uh, the, bowl, the bud. Anyway, they're, they, they're called an onion, but they don't, they taste like garlic. Anyway. Uh, but I think you can eat everything. Although I have heard that if you eat too many, you can get kind of a stubby day from it. If you eat too many. I've never eaten too many. <laughs> Go ahead, next slide. This is my very per my personal favorite. And if you can see the foliage on this clump of the left hand side, see how skinny the leaves are? I mean, they're just <coughs> tiny little. Just almost grass like in a, in a bunch. Well, that's what Indian carrot looks like. And it grows in, it doesn't grow in the rocky places as much as, as all the other things we've been talking about. It tends to like deeper soils. And it's a real pain in the rear to dig, as far as I'm concerned, because it has very weak stems. So if you dig down a ways and start pulling, you end up with the top in this hand, the roots still on the ground. So they have very deep roots. Uh, but they're, they taste like a cross between a fresh green pea out of the garden, and their texture is kind of like uh, a, uh, we'll try, a water chestnut, a little crunchy. Ooh. We had some of those the other day, too. I, I love them. They're my favorite. And they like a little bit damper ground. Yeah, a little bit. But Just not, a little bit. But not like right along the stream bed. No. Uh, 
Anyway, uh, that's and that's those up in the upper right hand corner are the tubers that are in a hopper motor, the hole in a hopper motor. Next slide. This is the prettiest of all, I think. It's it's a um, totally different species. It's called bitterroot, which and there's tons of geographic names all over the Northwest that have bitterroot in them. And just like, um, well, I'll talk about it later, my canvas, but these are widespread all over the Northwest. There's places in Idaho that are named like, the bit, well, is it bitterroot mountains? Are those in Idaho? Or those Montana. 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 Montana, excuse me. Well, that's why, and they're all over. Um, these are probably the most, if, if Indian people were going to dig these for commerce, I think these would be, in, when they're dry, they're in the highest demand. Um, they don't drink it for commerce, but if they did. Um, anyway, this was late, named after Meriwether Lewis of the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Um, I guess the Lewis and Clark Expedition ate a lot of these because they were not very well prepared to live for two years on, on the move across the United States, and thank goodness for people like the Nez Perce and other tribes to help them make it, because Camas was another mainstay for the Lewis and Clark expedition. Slightly bitter flavor. Um, I've been told the best time to dig this is when the plant's still green, because the, the green part goes away and then the flowers come up. And But when the green's still there and there's a little flower bud in the middle, that's when you're supposed to dig them. And I dug a couple this weekend, and they were, it was easy to strip the skin off the roots. Uh, so you're saying that that's too late? Yeah, the, the flowers the flower flower. are gorgeous. Uh, in fact, there are there are horticulture species of Lewisii they sell at the garden centers now, and they have a similar flower. Next slide. This is, there's two kinds of balsam root in this county. And for some reason, I never have enough sense to take a picture of the other one. Um, this is called Balsamoriza hookeri, and it's and there's another one called Balsamoriza. Come on, you know the name. Sagittarius. Thank you. Where'd that come from? Good job. Um, and the other one has gray green leaves, and it's the leaves are very you know, They're very normal leaves. These are very very. Uh, I guess I call them. And they're very, very uh, serrated, I guess is the best way for it. But they're kind of used for the same thing. Apparently the shoots, when they're first coming up in the spring, are good. I've never tried them, so I can't swear to that. But also they produce a small sunflower-like seed later on in the summer that can be harvested. And then they, they probably parch them in, a, in one of those woven little baskets that you, you put over the fire and make everything like like popcorn, but not quite so so extreme. But anyway, you parch them, and then you can take the, the seed shell off and get the seeds. A lot of work, and I don't think the seeds are probably any bigger than all like that. But when that's what you're living off, that's what you have to do. But these these are out in the stinking waters this last weekend. They're everywhere for this everywhere. particular variety. The best place I've seen to see the other kind are when you're driving over Wrights Point, going south. And you go over the hill and look back on that south facing slope, they're just everywhere up there. The seeds and the shoots are edible. Next slide. This one is one that I didn't realize grew here until about, I don't know, four years ago. And I happened to be out again in the stinking waters. Right next to the highway, there was some yellow version of this. And I don't know if well, this Waithia is. If you see the yellow and the white are two different species of the same Waithia, of Gulazir, but I'll have to check up on that. But at any rate, you see white and you see yellow. And those, they're pretty good sized plants. They're very ornamental. Big daisy flowers on them that are probably this big around. And I think the seeds were primarily the only thing Indian people were interested on these guys later on. Uh, but it's kind of a shock to see one of these because everything else is kind of low to the ground and these guys are standing up and making a show. Next slide. This is an odd one. Um, this is a real tasty lily um, called 
well, I always think of Calaportis, but it's Mariposa really. Um, it's, when you find it, you find one, there's one there, and then maybe there's another one 50 yards over there. And I've never seen more than three or four in one place. So if you're actually focusing on Mariposa lily for your dinner, you're gonna have to cover a lot of ground because they just don't seem to congregate. Plus they grow in sagebrush, they grow in dry grassy lands. So they're not all that common. I found a, a I think it was called a chocolate lily out um, on the Northwest side of, of Cattle Valley a while ago, doing a, or years ago, doing a, a fence or a pipeline survey. And it was beautiful, but it was, there wasn't another one around for, I didn't see any more, just one of them. Uh, but at any rate, these are edible and they're available in the summertime or later, like in June, July-ish. But they're a beautiful lily. And the gold burial. Next slide. Oh, I want to go back for a second to, um, sorry, just leave a preview there. I want to talk a little bit about Indian carrot. I, I love Indian carrot, and I know the first pipe probably do too. But there are some tribes in Oregon that almost lived on this stuff, um, especially down in Klamath, Klamath country, Lakeview-ish, East Central Oregon. Um, apparently, there's a lot more of those plants per square inch than there are up here, although there are a number of them here. In fact, we have both species in Orange County. But the interesting thing is, I think there were people that depended on them, like the, the Klamath tribe of harvesting locusts, which is a seed head of a, a floating plant that you find in ponds or marshes. I think they focus on Indian carrot seed almost as much. So um, I'm not sure how important the carrots are here, but they sure are me. Um, but I haven't really heard the tribe, tribal people talking about digging them. I don't know, maybe they get tired of having to dig so far down and then it breaks off before you get out of the hills or something. Okay, we're coming up to canvas. Canvas is, well, I got another page on canvas, so I guess I can wait. Um, but it's the mainstay of many tribes, not just locally, but I used to work for the Corps of Engineers in Eugene, and my job was to walk around in reservoir bottoms in the wintertime when the reservoirs would let down and look for archaeological sites that were never discovered before they built the dam, because most of those dams were built in the 50s, 40s, 60s, before they did any cultural resource type stuff. And there's a lake west of Eugene called Fern Ridge Reservoir, and it's flat and pretty good size. And there's even an obsidian source on the edge of that lake. Um, it's from the high cascades that got washed down thousands of years ago. Anyway. I have never seen so many canvas roasting ovens anywhere at Fern Ridge, Fern Ridge Reservoir. Of all the sites we recorded, along the stream banks, we'd find campsites where they were making tools and other activities. But almost everything we saw were these rings of broken rock about 10 feet across, maybe a little bigger, maybe a little smaller. And we probably recorded 80 sites like that in the bottom of Fern Ridge Reservoir. And we didn't survey the whole lake because it's not totally empty in winter. That was real a trip. Mud clear up to here all day. But anyway, uh, Camas was huge. The Willamette Valley was full of it. There's, if, if you got here before all the pivots were built on the way to Buchanan, you would have seen how big a Camas fields there, are, there were out there. Um, so Camas had to be big here at one time. The only thing I can, the only thing I can say about Camas is that about the local tribal people is that I think their access got cut off so early because everybody that moved here from the west, from the east, all the settlers, the land they picked for ranching and farming was going to be the meadow land, the flat land. And so as soon as they got here, they started building fences and keeping people off their land, and the tribe got blocked from using them. So I don't think the I don't think the local first pipe have a whole lot of focus on canvas because of that, but that was on the next page. See, I'm getting ahead of myself. Better turn the page, sorry. Um, I think the reason, the main reason is that canvas was blocked, and so their traditions with canvas were cut off at that particular point, about maybe 1870, 1880, in that period. Um, the, the canvas oven, whole idea of camas ovens. When you eat camas raw, 
as Dave did the other day, he discovered that it was a little bit gluey. I don't know if any of you guys were old enough to beat paste when you were in grade school. <laughs> I know I did, because it was a good flavor of wintergreen. Oh, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> anyway, that stickiness on your teeth is, you get the same effect when you eat gems. And I read something very interesting today. Um, even when they're cooked, they have this stuff called inulin, inulin in them. And inulin is apparently sweet. It's what makes them sweet. But we can't digest it. So don't get carried away and eat a whole bucket of cats because you're going to be having flatulent problems afterwards. Just want to let you guys warn you. Uh, but anyway, the roasting oven is basically you start a fire, you get it red hot, you throw in a, a bed of, of rocks, then you throw in um, a layer of, of vegetation like grass, then you throw in all your cattle skulls, then you cover them up with grass, and then you cover the whole thing up with the soil or the dirt you dug out when you dug the pit. And you let them roast for two or three days. And it was really interesting too, I also read today, and I've read it before, uh, that women and men were not allowed to uh, do anything during that period because they didn't want to ruin the roast, basically. So three days later, they basically upend everything that's in this pit. And I've had roasted cannabis, and it's really good. It's like barbecued onions, but they don't really taste like onions. They're just more Swedish, but very good. So if you ever have a chance to have some roasted cows, take it. It's exquisite. Well, in some of the local pipes do talk about the field of cows near, near Harney. Yeah. And also up in the Sylvie's Valley. Yeah, and that I makes guess. sense, because Sylvie's would have had more than they have now. They remember. They remember it, and they wish they still had access to it. Yeah, because when they, had, when they lost this food stuff, they probably lost at least half of the vegetables they would dig or harvest. Because we eat around town, there's beds, small beds of cannabis. Yeah. They'll be blooming in a while. But the Buchanan Highway, or the Buchanan, Buchanan yeah. there's thousands of acres of cannabis. I mean, that's a lot of food. Yeah, it's a lot. Well, what did they replace that calorie count with? Um, oh, they probably didn't. They probably starved for a while. I know they had a tough time. They yeah. starved. They went they to Yakima for a while, starved. thanks to the US military. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then when they kind of filtered back, back, the first place they lived was up, you know where the, let's see where the back of the cemetery is? Mm -hmm. One road over, oh, that road, right up there, yeah. it's old camp. Yeah. Um, and that was, I don't think they really got there until the late, late 1800s. So I, I don't think they dug any cameras anymore. Well, it's, well, and it's kind of a sad thing, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, not to mention just getting taken to Yakima in the middle of winter you know, oh, in open huh. wagons. So anyway, uh, canvas, wherever anybody lost canvas in Oregon, it was a huge blow. In Western Oregon, they probably lost more people than here from disease because they, they got malaria really bad, basically from the Hudson Bay Company in Vancouver, Washington. Um, someone had malaria on a boat, gave it to Almost every Malata Valley Indian tribe was decimated by that because they'd never been exposed to malaria. So, also, Camus was at the center of the uh, Bannock uprising. In yeah. The Some yeah. Guys, with a herd of pigs, I believe. Some yeah. Camus. That's what they do. Is they hear the farmers. The first thing they do is is turn the pigs loose and let them eat all the Camus. And I'm sure the Don and Glisten Valley had Camus too. Anywhere there was a wet spot. Yeah. that flowed water, there would be cannabis. And in fact, if you go up the single waters today, there's little teeny creeks. I mean, they're, they're not even, they're seasonal. They're not even wet all summer. They've got cannabis in them. So, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, and I, I mentioned that most of the cannabis beds between here and Buchanan have been turned into pivots. Yep. So they're gone. It's really too bad because it was such an incredible view right, yeah. in, right in the east. And I mentioned, I mentioned Meryl Couture, um, appreciate her master thesis at Portland State. She was there, she was leaving by the time I got there in the late 70s. Um, recent and Contemporary Foraging, Foraging Practices of the Honey Valley Paiute by Meryl Couture. And I'm pretty sure there's a copy here. 
Yeah, I have a copy of the one for Mr. Yeah, good. Yeah, and you can find it online. Yeah, there. it's a really nice one. The biggest problem is um, all the photographs are black bad black. Xeroxes, they're all blacked out. And then the other thing is most of the plants are, well, all the plants are illustrated with line drawings. And they're not bad, they're good drawings, but they're just not the same as a, as a photograph. Okay, one more page, I think. More print. This is what dawned on me today between my surgery oh, and okay. getting ready to come up here. Um, all of a sudden I thought, you know, the one thing I'm leaving out is the, the relationship archaeologists have to plants and why they even have one. I mean, I'm really interested in plants more so than your average person, so that's part of the reasons I like these plants. But they're really important to archaeologists because whatever people burn in their fires, whatever they cook, and or whatever they throw into their fires after they've cooked or whatever fell in the fire that they're cooking, a lot of times that material is gonna be turned into charcoal or carbon. And when it's carbon, it doesn't go anywhere unless you smoosh it all up. So uh, we study, one of the things that archeologists are interested in is what people ate, how they prepared it. Um, all these little slices of life that we all know what we're doing, but We'd like to know what they do, and archaeologists basically study the, the things people throw away and have thrown away throughout time. And in Harney County, we have a site that dates to 17,000 years ago, so that's a long time. Uh, and carbon will last in an archaeological site that's not exposed to the air or you know, gets eroded away. It will, it will survive there for a long time. Um, anyway, so we, let's see. We have, whenever we dig up any carbon in a site, be it a, a black, I found a midden in, in uh, Skoka Goons that was about this thick, and it's all black. It's nothing but charcoal and seeds and pieces of pottery and just all kinds of stuff mixed together. But that black has hundreds of different, or could have five to 10, 15 different kinds of seeds or charcoal from different sources or piece of just what they call starchy tissue that could be from a bulb or a tuber. So we have favorite people, I have a favorite person that lives over by uh, um, Pleasant Hill that is a paleoethnobotanist. And what she does, what archaeologists do, we find a midden, we find a, a strip of black in uh, profile, we take a sample, we send the sample to her. She does this water screening technique, it's called formation, flotation where she floats all the charcoal to the surface, skims it off, and then she goes and lets it dry, and then she looks at a microscope at everything in there. She can tell us what kind of firewood that was burnt in the campfire. Um, usually sagebrush around here, but they did use willow on occasion. Um, and other things like service berry, anything available. Um, a juniper, of course, too. And she can tell us uh, dozens of different kinds of seeds, burn up seeds, that, and one of them in particular is called wada. It's a little teeny seed that's black, it's about the size of a basil seed. I don't know if you guys have ever seen sweet basil seeds, but they're tiny. And they are harvesting this at the edge of Mount Air Lake every fall. And the local Indian tribes, the local Indian tribe is called wadadikin, which means wada eater. They were named after the, the uh, plant food that they relied on. So that was the last plant they harvested from in throughout a year is at the edge of Harney Lake, or Mallory Lake. But the example that I'm gonna use is out of Rimrock Rock, Rock Shelter, the one site that I just told you that's 17,000 years old, we had a uh, hearth that we came across about, oh, did I say eight feet? About eight feet below the surface. The site is about 13 feet deep, so it's almost two thirds of the way down. Found a hearth, sent a sample to Marge, my friend over in Pleasant Hill, and she reported back that she found she found uh, wapato seeds, burnt wapato seeds. Well, wapato today lives in shallow lakes or on the edges of lakes. It's a water, it's a, clearly a water plant. It doesn't grow on dry land. And it's really common, like Vancouver, Washington, Portland, Salem, that whole string of, of wetlands basically on the Willamette Valley and north into Washington. Um, and I wasn't, I'm not aware of any Wapato growing naturally in Marine County. There may be some somewhere, but I haven't heard of it. And so basically, um, 
we got a date back. It was just about 10,000 years ago. And so at the same time, there was a, a contractor working on an excavation out by the fairgrounds, the racetrack, on a, a cell tower job. And he found, they found a hearth down about three feet because they had a shallower site. They sent in a sample and they got Wapato seats back. And the date was 10,000 years old. So we learned a lot from knowing what thing people were eating. Number one, we learned that Wapato did exist here at one time. And it's, it's a really good source of food. It's, it's a potato-like uh, underwater uh, tuber that's about this big around. And I guess it tastes a lot like potatoes. Uh, anyway, so we have independent 10,000 year dates for two different sites on the same year of the same plant that no longer exists. So I think it's locally extinct, which is good to know that because it was here at one time. So something changed between 10,000 years ago and today, and it basically got hotter and drier. And the lakes are no longer around like they were. And if there's anywhere that has any, it'd be down here, right? But I don't think it's gone dry a couple times in the last 100 years. So um, I would say we learned that not only was Wapato used, you know, it was used 10,000 years ago, and we also learned that climate has changed in the last 10,000 years. Now, that's not really a, all that new of information, that last one, because we kind of already knew that. But still, it's nice to get confirming data. And that's why we use paleoethyl botanists to help us figure out what plants are in the charcoal layers in our sites. Scott, uh, does that mean that the where that grew was wet all the time? It had to be, it had to be wet had to be all the time. Lake. Okay. Yeah. So we knew there there's a lot of little dry lake beds around this county, especially oh, yeah. out west. Lots. Um, I call it the lakes country. But most of them are dry now, and occasionally a few of them get wet, and we have plants that grow in there because it gets wet. But um, most of those may have been full, and they were really full back 17,000 years ago. They were much bigger and more widespread. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can't wait to hear what the paleobotany is on the, the seeds and stuff and all the charcoal that came from the 17,000 year period. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to finding out what kinds of foods they're eating then. I know they were still burning sagebrush because sagebrush has been here for a long time. It's been here most of the Pleistocene. Yeah. So, um, I don't think I have any more, but if anybody, no one's hardly anybody's asked questions. I'm probably talking too fast, so maybe you missed it. Go ahead. Well, I have a question for the, before the, the various tubers are cooked. How are they prepared? Washed, scraped? Yeah. Well, they, well, I think, at least for the, least for the um, Vista root, they strip the skin off um, and they chop the top off or wrung it off, you know, like you do with some things. And then I don't know if they actually sliced them in half to dry or just left them like they were to dry in the sun um, out in the open air. In Hearn County, it's not hard to dry anything very fast. Um, so that's, I think, how they dry them. And then I think. I don't think they um, hauled everything around that they that they procured there. I think they cached things. I'm not sure how they cached them, but they were going to be back that way later, so they could have picked them up later. That was a, that's the biggest uh, one of my biggest questions about archaeology or prehistoric living is if you cache all this stuff and you've got a 60,000 square acre home territory and you're, right, you're walking around this big circle every year. Maybe it varies different places, but you're still covering a huge amount of ground. How do you how do you uh, logistically cache all that stuff and then come back and get it to where and take it to wherever your winter camp's going to be? And most of the winter camps were around Mountain Lake because that's where the water is. Um, and I'm sure there are other winter camps along streams that flow all winter, um, lower, lower elevation, you know, sandy spots. Well, how do they pick a hot spring? Or a hot spring, yeah. yeah. How do they keep the animals from getting into that, into that food? I mean, if yeah. humans were eating them, as well, I'm assuming there's some other mammals out there that would be yeah. eating them. And I, I, you know, I, I can see twine and sagebrush bark bags or, or, or you know, uh, 
in the, in the plains, Being they dug bell shaped pits. Yeah, I think a pit too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, pits. Right. and then, like you said, tools, you typically cache some tools in there at the bottom. And then to keep it from collapsing, you want to fill it. So a lot of times they're just filled with debris. Totally. And until you dig them out, you'll find the tools in the box. So I was curious if you've ever found any evidence of a cache pit here with any fun. On one excavation, in? we found what looked like a cache pit. I mean, because we just we were doing it one by one, so we kind of bisected it. We didn't even know it was there until we started digging. But it had kind of a narrow, it was black, the whole thing was black, but it was narrow on top. Of yeah, it's a bell shape. Yeah. So it was just like a plant. And we had the, and we had the charcoal taken out of there with the black material. And uh, we thought we'd get some plant seeds or some other stuff to give us an idea of what they were putting in there. Turns out it was mold. Huh. It's all black spores from mold. No. Kind of weird, but well, that's unexpected. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially when we were getting Elko ear points from that site and they're at least one thousand years old. So mm -hmm. um, but that's all I have. You guys have any more questions? I have one about the collection of, of these plants um, in the Steady Water Mountains where I spend a lot of time as well. And I've seen groups of Native Americans, um, you know, out there harvesting them, families with little children and all that, mm -hmm. I mean, on the hillside and stuff. And uh, you notice, I said in one, one of somewhere in there that if you see them doing that, you're supposed to leave them alone? Yeah, I would. Only because, like I said uh, right before that, yeah. Some of the people that are out there, it's a spiritual experience. It's not just a physical activity. Because my first impulse would be to go up and say hi. Oh, and you're, you, and you're, you're very gregarious. So I that's, am. Yeah. And so I would want to be talking to them and asking them questions. But. Well, I, you know, I don't know. I, I probably need to take a poll. But that's sort of the impression I got. Whenever I go out somewhere and I see someone working that I know is from the tribe, I just turn around and take off just to leave them alone. I don't know. Does anybody have any other ideas? Well, there's family plots. Yeah, see, that's the okay. thing. It's family. And there's some some animosity. Don't get in my badge. And I've seen that happen out here. So. And they don't want somebody from outside coming in and messing yeah. with their badge. Yeah, no. Yeah. It would be strictly a, a a friendly hello and asking yeah. them questions about. There's about what they're doing. Of secrecy about where the patch is. Yeah, I remember one time I found a patch. I was out in a place that I didn't expect to find any roots, and I found this huge concentration of bitterroot. And bitterroot is really important um, to the local root gatherers. I think that's their number one selection of species. Yeah. And uh, so I called Minerva Susie, and I. I think I called her right. I don't know if I sent her an email or called right. I don't know. <laughs> about a half an hour later, I get this panic response. Don't tell anybody about it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I said, why? She, I said, I always, whenever I find a place like that, I tell someone at the tribe. She goes, that's my spot. Oh, <laughs> exactly. So she'd already been wandering around out there. We wouldn't expect I heard her find. her to say it. But it was yeah. fun. I mean, I never told anybody about precisely where it is, but. Right. God, I was amazed that she would even be that prompt to be in the path because usually the stinky waters are the focus because they have so many other roots. And this yeah. place was was told I was you know I couldn't imagine anybody going there to look for roots, but they were there. I think it'd be almost kind of a, I mean you think it's kind of a ceremonial type experience. Yeah. So if somebody was getting baptized in a river, would you walk up and go, oh hey. You know, how's it going? How's the water? Yeah. How's, how's the water? water? <laughs> you know, yeah. like you got to kind of respect people's uh, yeah. privacy. Yeah, that's the only reason I. I mean, well, I'm I, glad you mentioned it because otherwise, my I would just follow my impulse. Well, I, don't, I, I don't mean to be unfriendly. I, I just, yeah. I've been out with the elders a while, a long while ago. We used to have um, a lot of field trips, and we had this monthly elders potluck, and mm -hmm. it was a lot. I got to know a lot of the elders that way, and, and we went on a couple of field trips. And, and I did. They didn't talk about the fact that it was 
so nice when the cows weren't there, when there were no other people there, yeah. when it was solitude. So it was like just them. Yeah. 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 And, and as a matter of fact, they camped out there in the sun this weekend. I was mm -hmm. glad to see them. Yeah. Um, okay. Because well, they've kind of abandoned the camps, too. That's the other problem is the camps, many of the camps close to Highway 20 are uh, accessible for anybody because they're all public land. So there are a lot right. of people that pull in that are just in there, you know, what do you call it? Glamping? No, not glamping. Uh, boondocking. Boondocking. Right. Yeah, well, people yeah. drive along and think, it's cool around here, there's a nice place there, and they spend the night and take off the next day. Well, a lot of those places where they're going, if they're high and dry, they're a root camp. Right. And, uh, so. Okay. I was out there with Minerva one time, and, and she had a stop at a road camp. And it was, this is bad stomach rock. Oh, bad stomach rock. Bad. You got to harvest this bad stomach rock. And what it was was a winter zeolite. Oh. And yeah. so we went on and did a lot of work documenting using it in office. And well, that makes sense. But, you know, I followed Minerva's lead there. And well, I guess they use clay minerals for cleaning you out. <laughs> so. Zeolite would work for that. Oh, yeah. Very, very well. Anybody else have any? Comments or questions or information or how much of a a source of overall food do you think these root crops were? I mean, they had to supplement, right? With well, I mean, could you survive on root crops alone? I, I, I it's interesting in, in Meryl's book she has a lot of calorie right figure she has she has uh, vitamin C but a few other vitamin uh, she did some actual testing or had somebody else do it. On the nutritional value, right? I would say you'd have to be bringing in some protein because they're not protein rich, right. just like at any balanced diet, we vegetables and protein. Um, but there's but, no legumes in here. I mean, that would have high protein content. No, the only legumes that they could eat are probably hallucinogenic, so you wouldn't want to eat it. Asparagus? Right. No, it's not a legume. It's local wheat. Local wheat. It's not. It's not a legume. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there are any legumes available. Right. So, you know, water was very high in protein. Was it? Water was? That's what I've heard. Very protein -based. And I think they collected it by laying down a cloth underneath the. Tiny, tiny. And then very getting the bush and knocking it down right. on that. Because the seeds are really tiny. Right. I mean, it, but. And, and I don't think they have much of a husk on them. So I think if they parched them and then round them, they were there. It didn't require a whole lot of effort to get them ready to eat. Mm -hmm. But except for beating the bushes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And but, remember, eggs were a source. That's true. Oh, that's you got thought. lots of eggs. Right. And small mammals, large yeah, mammals. Birds. But yeah. Crickets. Um, I wonder if that claim had like salmon. Yeah, and they had salmon in the Mountain right. River before the dam came in. So. so. <laughs> yes. You haven't mentioned berries or well, you know, I have, grass grains. I have, a, <laughs> I have two. This is spring, so I do it in spring. But I have summer and fall too. Yeah. I have a English presentation on summer and fall plants. And I use and I go into some of the plants used for making things, like mountain mahogany, willow, sagebrush, uh, juniper, all those different plants they used for uh, clothing and Close. structures and cordage. And I even have some Indian hemp growing in my garden that I want to get rid of. <laughs> it's a little invasive. Oh, well, it would be made its way into my greenhouse. So how much more of a crop this year compared to last year? And is it really uh, determined by the snowpack? Do you think that's why there's such a good root crop? Because we have the snowpack this the year. Moisture is definitely. Um, and the other thing I've noticed is uh, the last three to four weeks, we haven't had a frost. Right. This is unusual. We had this horrible winter. Right. And then when spring finally made it, yeah, but it's May is frequently it's, uh, it usually killers. I mean, crops. I've got an apricot tree I looked at today. It's full of little apricots. And that's unusual because it's the first one to bloom. So I think that's part of it. Um, cold temperatures after things have come up. But I think moisture is probably your biggest deal. It never a lot of it up there. So Do you think, I, like, compared to last year, there's twice oh, as much? Or? I, I don't know. Um, you know last year... I mean, I, I got pictures of them last year. I was out there last year. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I don't know, but I bet it's better this year. Um, it was, in fact, it was, I was digging in one place down the Stevie Water Access Road, and it, there was a there was a lamation there that was more gray green leaved, but but about the same height as cows, the bright green shiny leaf one. And I, I dug one of those because I didn't, I didn't think they'd have a tuber, and they didn't. But it was hard to tell the difference because it was so packed. There was so much stuff there. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of work, but I would say this this resource was probably, especially if they had access to cams, would probably be at least 50% of their diet. 50%. It's a lot. Some of the description of the way they stored them, especially the roots for the winter, was that they made a place near their winter camp where they were bringing things and storing them. And it looked like a a haystack. Oh, okay. The people going through the wagon trains for the daughter party set fire to all the haystacks they found. Oh, really? To burn people who would in winter food supply. So then when they were going hungry, the people back in Nevada that they just passed said, we helped you, but you burned all our food up. <laughs> yeah. So they knew they were up there, and they knew they could have helped them if they had food left, but we burned it all. Yeah. They were struggling that winter. Because that's tragedy, too. Yeah. I, I don't, I probably shouldn't have said that. <coughs> there was a guy that, there was a big flood in the 80s here in Marin County, mm -hmm. in the mid-80s. Oh, man, I was there. And then the, basically the road from after Wright's Point is a causeway the whole way. It wasn't a causeway when I first came in 1980, so um, the, the lake went up way up, I mean 20 feet maybe, 15 feet. So they had to build new roads. Um, there were ice dams on Mount <coughs> Lake that start when the wind would pick up in the spring when they were thawing, it would shear off these archaeological sites that were on these little islands and yeah. little high spots out in the lake. So they had a big archaeological investigation for two years afterwards, and they did find some human remains. And the interesting thing I got out of that is that there are, there are places on your teeth where you can get lines if you've had, if you've been malnourished. And they, they get kind of, you kind of keep track of time that way. And they have a number of young people that had died um, and were buried in those places. And they showed early uh, interruption of growth basically because of lack of food. So I'm sure at the end of winter, especially a winter like this, there would have been a lot of people really, really, really hungry. Yeah. Um, and were they, lost all their weight. Were the tribes here ever issued they, they weren't didn't necessarily have a treaty, so were they ever issued um I can't think of the a lot term. of a lot of lands. Well no you'd get a certain amount of food. You'd get like a cow. Well, you'd they, get, they had a treaty early on. Well, they had a treaty that wasn't signed. Well, so that would have essentially replaced the camas. Yeah, yeah, they got supplies. No, but that was the way it was supposed to be. They had an Indian agent, they had, and they had a yeah. reservation up by Beulah, which is. So they were issued at some point. They were issued. Yeah. I can't think of it. New they tried to turn them into farmers. Yeah, it was only a short time. But it wasn't Which a long time. They ended up with an up Indian agent it. that cheated them. Yeah. Yep. Stole all the stuff. So well, they took all the free supplies and charged them money for everything. Yeah, I mean, Reinhardt. And that's one of the reasons we had the Bannock War. Was his treatment of the, of the, I guess you call them Burns Valley War. Burns might yet, because Burns was barely here. But, yeah. Um, yeah, that's another thing. I mean, uh, if, it's too bad they didn't give them the reservation they would have, they were going to give them. It was one million acres. Went all the way from the top of Strawberry Mountain all the way to basically yeah. French Glen, mm -hmm. close to it. The map that they showed at the. You wouldn't have had Heinz. You wouldn't have had Heinz. You wouldn't have had, that, large, yeah. you wouldn't have had that large timber sale. There'd be no Heinz. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, the Indians could, could sell timber land. I mean, they could have. The Warm Springs Indians has timber. So, anyway. But one time at the, at the um, I think it was at the, Archaeology Roadshow that the tribe was there and they showed they had photographs of maps of the original area that was set aside here and and then you know then a couple of photographs of maps in between and then finally the the time the contemporary the map time. which was it's, it's embarrassing it is but they they gave us a lot of lands. But of course, they gave them lands out east of the valley that nobody else wanted. Right. Um, and 
I mean, nobody wanted to claim it for homestead, even though they were on relatively flat ground because they alkali or whatever. Right. Well, they still got some. They still have it. They got those pieces. Yeah, but they have some new lands. They were, they were, we got some lands in Morgan Valley, which mm -hmm. still buys strawberries. Mm -hmm. And they have a big chunk over at Jonesboro on the Highway 20. I mean, you know, you start going out of the canyon, the railroad canyon, like there's somewhere along in there, there's a yeah. big chunk they have right on the Mallory River. Mm. Yeah. But they've had it. Big problems too, but they're well, not stupid. But they've had to really right. twist some arms to get that. They, right. I think they got EPA money to get it. One of them, and I'm not sure. I don't power maybe the other one. I'm not sure. But mm -hmm. anyway, that million acres come in real handy right now. Yeah, it was. Scott, these plants that you've discussed are incredibly important, and we saw with the pivots going. So most of these plants now are limited to BLM land. What exactly is BLM doing to make sure they're uh, not just surviving, but thriving? Because I know anytime I plant a place where a campus is in a bottom land, the cows take it. The cows yeah. devastate a lot of these. Absolutely, so they do. How, what's the policies? I know there's some, sites, are some areas yeah. where they keep it to harvest zone, but. Well, it's, it's kind of a complicated question. But there is, it, since the Burns Paiute don't have a treaty, and this was really a contentious issue with me to talking with them, they don't have a treaty, so they didn't cede any land. They didn't give away any land like the Klamath and the Modocs did or the Warm Springs did um, or the Acma did. They, they have signed treaties, so the lands they got, they gave away. They still have rights on the other lands. For instance, if you have a favorite fishing spot and you have a, a you have ceded lands in a treaty, you can't be denied fishing on that spot. Um, even I think if it's on private land, I'm not positive about that. But um, so you're right. Most of the ground, even though they still use it, we can't bar the public from using it in the same way. Although I don't think we need to worry about that too much. Um, I set, I set up a monitoring project that was set up by a woman uh, who's a botanist out of Lakeview. Um, and it was 13 locations out there where I took a 50 meter tape and ran them from a pin and then a compass bearing that I had in my notebook and counted every plant on there and species. Well, I had a lot of other stuff to do and we did that, I did that for two years. It almost drove me nuts because you, every year is different some years you can go out there, like this year, and go out there on you know May first, figuring you're going to see all this stuff, and there's nothing there, either because it's too dry or it's been too long a winter. So if you pick to do this rigorously, you got to pick the same day. But then all the other all the plants don't cooperate because they don't always come up at the same time. So I probably threw my hands up. I just basically would go out and drive around and look and see what it looked like. The biggest, I think, the biggest problem with this. The biggest threat to these roots is that, um, oh gosh, it's new grass that's invading East County. Uh, man, why am I forgetting this? Medusa. Medusa hair. That likes if if you look at if you look at the kind of soil Medusa head will prefer, and the kind of soil that roots prefer, they match up really well. Mm. I when we were working on a, a weed EA environmental assessment. I know a couple years before I retired, um, Pam Keller, who was our GIS person, who was really sharp, she, I said, I want to know what the soil type is in the stinking waters, where I know there are roots. And then I want to estimate how many acres of the whole district, that was three and a half million, is the same or allied soil type, because they're different names, different places, but they have the same. She mapped that out, and we, about 15% of BLM's ground is root ground based on that analysis. Mm. And a lot of that is in places where we've got Medusa head. And I think Medusa head, I've never seen it crowd out roots, but mm. it's possible. I saw someone that dumped a, dumped a bunch of hay in the middle of the gravel parking lot where the, where the Paiute people were, were gathered this weekend when they were camping. And the next year I'm out there, it's Medusa head all over the parking lot. Great. So I had our, our weed person spray the parking lot, that part of the parking lot. But 
Um, that's the other problem. If we're going to use herbicides to kill the medusa hair, um, we got to use one that doesn't affect the roots. And the roots are perennials, so they shouldn't be affected as much. And medusa head is an annual, so it's kind of like cheap grass. You've got to catch it when the time is right. So I think that's the biggest threat because I don't think we have an agricultural issue up in the places where they grow. A lot of it's on public land, which, barring a cataclysm, is going to stay as productive as it is now, I think. Um, that's why I don't want to talk too much about localities, like actual places, right. because I don't want to mess up the, the tribal root gathering program. But I like to talk about this stuff, so I want to talk about it, because people aren't, you know, we have a huge, it's a breadbasket, this county is. But you got to look, you got to know what to look for. And if you're willing to eat things, it tastes kind of like a carrot. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather have a carrot, but if I was if I had to live off of it, you live off of it. Did you say dried seed that stuff? The the uh say dried say well they eat the medusa head? Well they eat the carrots. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they aren't in the same place though. I mean there are some ground squirrels. I saw a couple ground squirrels up in a root camp last week where there's a mound of dirt where they all camp, and then there's the flat ground, rocky ground elsewhere all around it where they dug roots. And I and I saw serious badger problems in that site. There's a site there, and there's badger holes everywhere. So if you know if there's badger holes, there's got to be some ground squirrels because that's what they eat. And so yeah, but they don't seem to wander out. The the ground squirrels like being in deep soil or deeper soils. The soils out there. Are, you know, it's like a de desert pavement. It's just a rock layer, and there's soil underneath it, but they don't want to dig in that stuff, as far as I can tell. Cows, uh, I'm sure that we don't have dairy cows out grazing out there because they love onions. One year we had a huge onion year, and there's a little exposure up there around the spring, and the onions were just like this tall in the exposure to the fence line are low to the ground. <laughs> So I don't know what that milk tastes very good. Anyway, uh, there are a lot of things that bother roots, but like you'll see deer browsing on some of them, cows eat them. Uh, I've never really noticed cows causing that much trouble eating roots, because I think they'd rather eat grass. Um, but I think they still do nibble on them, and especially roots, or the onions, they love onions. But there are threats, but I don't think they're huge threats. If we were talking the canvas out here on private land, out towards Buchanan, then there's a threat. Because you can't, if you're a public landowner, or a private landowner, you can do what you want within the limits on your land. So I'm not bad about the pivots, I'm just saying, you know, it's a long term thing and it's not going to reverse itself. There are companies that sell seeds of these they collect and sell these seeds and i think there are companies that collect and sell the bulbs off of the lily family like canvas and a number of others um, so you can actually try restoration but we've never tried it and that that was a long answer to a question i got a minute ago um, we're not doing anything actively to try to uh, add, add to the root crops but we're in charge, I mean, BLM is the land manager, so we're responsible for the roots thriving. We're not necessarily responsible for how the tribe dig out there, but we're definitely responsible for making sure the plants are still alive the next year when they go out again. If that makes sense. So, so has that stayed fairly steady, whether or not we're standing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Right, well, that's what I thought for the last 10 years that I've been aware of. But. Yeah, I've been going, I've been out there more so when I first got here, because I was meeting with the elders out there, but mm -hmm. I go out there several times a year, um, try to in the spring, just to kind of tour. And I remember one, I remember a number of years back, people from the Yakima would call me and say, are the roots ready? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I always said no, because they weren't. They were calling from a place where they would be ready, to a place where it's colder and it won't be ready. So I have to lie to them, but I like saying no. But I did help a couple ladies in a band 
that were semi stuck in the mud out there during food season in the time from Yakima. So, anyway, that's it. Oh, go ahead. Do you know if the proposed housing area for the burn, the Miller Springs area, if that is going to be surveyed? Because uh, uh, we live up on Philippine Heights. You know, uh, yeah. And behind, we're be across the valley, you can see the Indian campground or Indian cemetery. Yeah. That is a, a very strong roof area. Is it? Oh, yeah. See, it's, I wouldn't have guessed that. But it's it's private land, and it's when we first moved here, it's unfenced, and you could walk and everything, and now it's being developed. So, where is the Miller? Where do you, if you're in town, what street do you take to get to it? The, well, you go out towards the Monroe Correction Facility. Oh, and there. the housing development that they mentioned is on the right. Oh, so it's on, yeah. And it goes all the way to where there's one. Yeah, and uh, almost all the way to Travis Cemetery. Yeah. Oh, yeah, behind it. Wow. All the way over there. Well, see, that's that's going to be a problem because that is a lithosol. We call them lithosols, rocky soil. In fact, that's not even used by soil scientists anymore, but I like it. But, any rate, yeah. That, um, is there any public money involved? Would be the birds. Yes, it's municipal. Well, then it's covered by state law. If it's if it's federally funded, then federal law would require a cultural resource survey. If it was state funded, then or state channeling money to cities, I'm pretty sure the state would require it too because I know if Heights want to put in another communication tower up on. Burns Butte. I just got a call today from one of the guys there. And they have to do a clearance because the state of Oregon is making sure they do. So that would seem even on private land if it's if it's public money going in. Especially that piece. Of it should be covered under yeah. state law or federal law. Mm -hmm. And I imagine they're applying a lot of obsidian problems too because there, there's a lot of obsidian coming down that yeah. hill. Uh, well, knowing what's on my place. I would think so. It's just across. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's the same thing. Well, I think where are you going to get the dirt? Where are you going to get your water? Well, I, it's 50 50 because we don't want urban sprawl. So you have to have denser housing, but it's hard to see some of these really choice areas that people just don't appreciate because they haven't seen it. Right. Yeah, I mean it's got a lot. That's what I mean. Right? Eastern Eastern Oregon has a lot going for it. it just you just got to get out of your car and walk around and look around. Yeah. Because I, I mean I've seen some incredible displays of uh, spring blocks. There's a pink and a kind of a blue color, whitish blue, and they'll just be paths all over the place. Lots of American gorillas. Oh, you've got them up there. See, I, I know where to dig them. <laughs> Are they actually close together? Are they friendly? Well, you can stories? see you can see three or four every time. Well, that's see. good. I know. Over a wide area. Yeah. Yes, I've got, but it's funny yeah, how they do that. Yeah. Yeah. You think they would grow yeah. closer together because they, but maybe they're not very friendly to each other. I think the species spread out. Yeah. So you wouldn't really target that species unless you just wanted to be a to have because you like them. Yeah. It would be a fair amount of bitter root on that bridge. Fair amount of what? Bitter root. Yeah. But you say it's all private land. Yeah, because I used to ride it a lot. Because I had access. Well, if you guys want to look at some of these plants, I've dug some. Yeah. Suzanne and I dug some. Um, we got to see some wild horses that day. And then apparently, the herd of wild horses that hangs around the top of the sinking waters has a lot of draft horse blood in it. Because there was big horses. Mm -hmm. Really pretty ones, too. It's pretty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think I can leave that in there because they can copy.